So let's just begin with, I am slightly obsessed with the Zed Technician line of indie horror titles. Just a little bit, you know? But you guys seem to be too. Seeing as how when I asked if you want to see a lore video covering the then 10, now 11 as of this writing games currently available to us, you guys emphatically took me up on it. There was like two, maybe three whole comments even asking for it. For my channel, that's a lot. So who am I to disagree? Join me today for a look at the limited, rather enigmatic lore of the strange world of the Zed Technician indie horror titles. Let's do it. Greetings, everyone. This is the Hipster Snack, and today, for what was supposed to be the week of Halloween, so much for that, I'm honoring a sort of promise to deliver the lore video. Today, we'll be visiting what might or might not be a small town, nestled somewhere in what might or might not be the forests of what might or might not be the southern United States. See? Clear and concise, right? As of this writing, we have 11 games to draw upon, and of those, we actually don't glean too much useful information. As since each game is a horror comedy, the characters inside are usually preoccupied with their own respective predicaments to give us a whole lot of important world-building information. So we'll need to look closely, oftentimes while on a deadline looming over our heads, and frequently this information will bleed over game to game. As a result, I'm going to try my best to explain the events of these games as they happen very roughly chronologically in universe and in terms of their overall relevance as best as I reasonably can. In case I haven't made it clear, this will be no small feat. We'll begin with a deep dive of the plots as they come up, and then follow up with speculation and some ideas I've had. Spoiler alert, not too many, because these games are tight-lipped. I will also try to specify when what I'm saying is a stated fact, something Zed Technician confirmed to me via DM, or merely my own speculation. By the way, there are two fan wikis and huge listings of these games on TV tropes, and you want to know how much help they were in writing this? None. The wikis are blank. The TV tropes are full of wild, bizarre, and inaccurate assumptions. So I'm actually trailblazing this path for you all. You're welcome. And one more important note to operate on as we go forward. Most of the games have multiple endings, which hinge on your performing your tasks perfectly. So the technician himself did confirm to me the best ending of each game is the canon story for each. Thus, unless important information is gleaned from any of the alternatives, we'll be going forward with this analysis under the assumption that you're witnessing the best ending possible. That lengthy preamble out of our way, let's begin with what Zed Technician was kind enough to qualify as the first game chronologically, that being The Man from the Window. In The Man from the Window, we meet one Mama Rabbit. We would later learn in the sequel game her name is Diane, but details. After a long day of work at one Bartleby's bakery, she returns home to her son, who's simply named Junior. Now, here's where I need to actually pause that train of thought and explain something. Bartleby's bakery is actually a reference to a gameplay location found in the bit more No. 2, one of the games that's no longer available. I'm not going into the details on how or why I know this, as the story of the two removed games is largely unimportant, and I want to respect Zed Technician as a creator and an indie game dev. Maybe if I get his express green light at a later time, I'll go into those more in the future. But back to the actual point. Mama Rabbit's handed a book by her son, and after some confusion about its origins, they realize the book contains a rhyming warning for the two, that the strange man is nearby and plans to take one of them away to be his new friend. Whatever that means. I actually pride for more information on this, as the nature of the book itself is debated among fans. Some seem to think that reading the book itself is what draws the man to his victims, others thinking that it's some kind of counteractive force that brings the book as a warning to them, and I at one point even speculated that this might be the man's own understanding of fair play at work, though I kinda doubt that given that the man is referred to in the book in a third-person narration. Anyway, the book does give us some insight to the nature of the man in a small number of ways. It specifically mentions he has no friends, no living family members, and is on the hunt for a new friend, though the meaning of that key phrase is left ominously vague. We also learn the man must operate under very specific conditions. People being hounded by him get a five-minute window of opportunity to hide or distract the man, and then he is given a five-minute window to hunt for them. However, 
Whether by supernatural force or the man simply lacking patience, the book does seem to imply the latter, but who really knows, the man will relent and leave, possibly to go harass someone else. Ultimately, Mama Rabbit is successful at hiding both Junior and herself, stalling the man out for his five-minute deadline by barricading and locking doors and distracting the man with delicious donuts, and also being sure to use the hints found within the book's pages. We then jump ahead chronologically to where most of the other games take place around the same approximate time frame window. Once more, Zed Technician was kind enough to explain this, so now we know the basic through line of events, up until something changes our understanding. In fact, in The Man from the Window 2, we meet Diane Rabbit again as a grandmother rabbit, protecting her granddaughter Audrey from the man and poor grammar. We learn along the way that that man never did give up his pursuit and would go after the rabbit family many more times. However, even after ripping the pages from the book, the man is foiled again by the family's quick thinking, and we get to see Junior Rabbit grown up and working for one Stalin Co. shipping company. Keep that name in mind, it'll be important later. And now, we need to sidestep to focus on a much less loving family, that being the rich and powerful Vermander family. The Vermander household appears to be among the oldest of the old money in the area, living in a palatial estate which we see the rundown remains of in Midnight Midnight. While it may not have been the sole source of income, we do know that no small share of their wealth and prestige hailed from making Faustian bargains with literal actual demons. Right, let me back up just a tiny bit. Near as we can tell, demons and gods are a real thing, and they are very proactive in this world. Did I leave that bit out? Kind of a thing. In fact, there's an honest-to-god summoning chamber in the Vermander Mansion, left in all its satanic glory for Ruth and Naomi to pick up after in the aforementioned game. Handily clad with what appear to be deer skulls, candles, and a full-on pentagram, just in case there was any ambiguity left. We also know that Jeremiah Vermander, the oldest named Vermander that we are yet aware of, was a rather dastardly old man who had no problem literally just killing people who displeased him. His son, Joseph, mournfully recounts the tale of servants being executed for displeasing the master of the house when we attempt to go into the kitchen, or how Jeremiah sent his butler Cornelius out into a blizzard just for the old man's newspaper and ultimately froze to death, or how about the time he murdered his son's fiance Agatha and disposed of the corpse below the floorboards of the house. To say that there's a lot of negativity around House Vermander would be underselling it somewhat. Thanks to Naomi and Ruth's fearlessness, Joseph is able to mentally walk through the haunting history of his own family's wrongdoing and realize that even in death he fruitlessly strove to gain the respect and approval of an inhumane father. Finally standing up to the brute, Joseph and the victims of the old man Vermander are able to finally move on and find peace, whereas Jeremiah himself finds only hellfire awaiting him. Ruth and Naomi are completely unfazed by any of this. However, things are rarely so simple. There is in fact a living heir to the Vermander name, one J.P. Vermander, name unknown. A rich and shrewd businessman who finds his particular donation to a local hospital is no longer netting him a big tax break. His assistant, Hannah, attempts to talk him down, but he is having none of it and summons the aforementioned literal actual demon to kill everyone in said hospital, these events unfolding in the Vermander curse. Luckily for the hospital's inhabitants, Hannah calls them and warns them of the rules the demon has to operate under in order to keep them all safe. You might find that the supernatural in this world is oftentimes bound by bureaucracy, which is something I just love about the way this is all set up. Dr. Ida and Nurse Morton successfully obey these conditions, and the demon fails to spill any blood that night. In the twilight hours just before dawn, it seeks out its former employer and attacks J.P. Vermander, all but killing him in the process. He ultimately ends up in the very hospital he sought to destroy, and has time to reflect on what he had done. He finally put together that those little numbers on his invoices actually meant something, and that he had been in the wrong the whole time. He resolved to become a better person, even as the loss of his demonic pact meant that the Vermander estate soon fell into ruins. What little of his fortune remained was donated to the hospital, and he himself got a job as a food delivery driver, having no other skills for himself. Thus was the Vermander home set up to be cleaned up and sold, bringing this paragraph neatly back around on itself. He also cameos in the extended ending of Man from the Window 2, confirming the approximate arrival time of the time skip and what is the now modern time frame. How handy. Speaking of chronology, the bit more no zero, where a lone human lady Sandra has her car break down in the dark spooky woods because, of course it does. She realizes she isn't alone as a huge and lightning-fast creature inhabits this forest and is very, 
very interested in a close encounter. Luckily, Sandra knows what's up and came with a shotgun, just in case of this kind of situation, I guess. I must say, the monster definitely must be made of some tough stuff, because getting blasted repeatedly point-blank in the muzzle with a shotgun merely causes it to rush back into the underbrush and shadows. It doesn't even bleed. Don't know what the supernatural horrors of this world are made out of, but I fear it. Anyway, there's no real lore to be found here. The game only contains one ending, with Sandra legging it with the rising sun and the strange creature carjacking her with a cute little vroom vroom to punctuate their encounter. Also in the dense woods is a sparsely filled in homestead, in no small part because a huge lot of land is presently occupied by a giant fish monster. Seriously, this thing is gigantic, and it has legs. It horrifies me, but more on that later. Monica, the witch, contacts the runner Angela, an anglerfish, to assist in annual magical rituals necessary to keep the giant fish under control. The spell seems to come with a lot of caveats and a lot of interesting ingredients to cook up, including stuff that usually only exists in the figurative sense, such as silver tongues and idle hands, but worry not. Monica insists they're all ethically sourced. I guess that makes it okay? Anyway, Monica cooks up the recipe, each conveniently saved to her laptop because I love these games so freaking much, and Angela runs the dark, spooky forest while being hounded by the terrifying parasites that live inside of the fish, who become free to roam when it runs close to awakening. Thankfully, however, they are able to gather the chains and invoke the ritual, keeping the fish dormant for another year, and the parasites eventually shuffling back inside. This one, there's not a whole lot of lore to take in. I did ask Zed Technician the real question, though. Is the fish the cause of the evil, or a victim of it? It turns out, the fish creature is actually a victim of circumstances. Absent the parasites, it would basically be harmless. But he didn't mention that a certain kind-hearted witch might well find a solution to that problem someday. And hopefully she does. Also, we can find Sandra off to the side now seemingly at peace with the forest monster who she adopted as a pet and gave the moniker Rex. Also, very cute. Meanwhile, at a little restaurant, the owner and sole cook, Maud, and the sole waitstaff, Sam, discuss the fact that their workplace is experiencing very tight finances as of late. Well, hashtag relatable. This is for a plethora of reasons, which Sam is all too happy to regale Maud with, but right at that moment, who should enter but a strange family of living silhouetted shadow people? However, they are all quite harmless, despite the uncanny appearance. They just want to grab a bite to eat. What is not so harmless, however, is the fact that the Shadow People explain that they are being pursued by the relentless entity known as the Shadow Catcher, whose sole job is to hunt down Shadow People who flee from the Shadow World. And while we don't know too much about it, it is described as a desolate place without light and awful in short order. What the Shadow Catcher does upon catching shadows is somewhat unclear, but implied to be somewhere between unpleasant and outright violent, and he won't be so kind as to give Maud and Sam special treatment should they be found harboring the Shadow People. Maud, however, insists that anyone is welcome, excepting, of course, troublemakers who would hurt her guests. So, over the course of the next three nights, Maud and Sam work together to keep their guests and themselves safely out of sight, and prepare delicious meals for the Shadow Family, who are insanely generous in their tipping habits. The Shadow Family also mentions a particular custom from their homeland where they must not speak aloud the name of a dish they want. This is considered very bad luck. In the normal difficulty, this proceeds with them giving you clues as to what dish they want via process of elimination. In the easier difficulty, they bring it up, mention that it would probably cause too many problems, and opt to order in regular fashion. This allows Maud and Sam to easily pay off their looming debts, and not long later, the Shadow Family returns, with lots and lots of friends. And in the end, the Shadow Catcher has a change of heart from the whole experience and takes to working as a waiter in the diner. This is up and away one of my favorite endings in any of these games. Oh, speaking of restaurants, it's time to check out Warrington's Burgers in Captain Warrington's Play Maze. There, young catboy Albert gets lost in the titular Play Maze, and the super, super, super cursed pirate statue of the newly made mascot, Captain Warrington, is there and ready to lure the boy into the supply closet to do... I don't know what, I prefer not knowing what, because beating the clock in the maze suffused with time distortion, however much sense that makes, is enough to rescue the lad at the 11th hour. Unfortunately, it falls to Ashley and Penny, the ladies on site that day, to facilitate said rescue, racing against the randomly generating pipe play maze and the puzzles which have the audacity to try to teach kids shapes and basic arithmetic. Which may or may not be the real horror at play here. We also learn of the mysterious whistleblower, T.W., but not a great deal else. 
The W might stand for Roaring, the name found on the company that owns the restaurants. It's possible, albeit not confirmed, the whistleblower might have been an insider who saw their own family's wrongdoing. Whether that's true or not, only time will tell. That said, in another part of town, we learn of a young lady named Gracie, who is soon ending her stay of employment with one NC Electronics. With some helpful guidance from Nurse Morton, who happens to call for some tech support with his PC, Gracie is able to land a new role at Stalin Co. Shipping Company. Told you I'd come up again. There, she meets Miss Faye, the Faye, and Mike, another shadow person. There, they learn they are in charge of protecting some old artifacts, which are implied, albeit not directly stated, to be the historical items mentioned in Midnight Midnight, items belonging to the Vermander estate. However, one of them appears to react in strange fashion, forcing them to investigate. When they do, the mysterious woman calling herself Nameless appears. I actually asked Zed Technician directly for her identity, and he was kind enough to qualify that it is in fact the goddess Isis. Whereupon they learn that Thoth and Sekhmet fully plan on destroying the entire world lest their artifacts are returned to them post-haste. Thus, with guidance and protection from Nameless, Gracie and company survive the crazy night and revive the Guardian, a being strong enough to single-handedly topple the servants of the gods, causing Thoth to concede his loss and leave peaceably enough. Jeremiah may have been a bit more than a touch crazy, but even he wouldn't destroy the entire world, the world's where he keeps his stuff. Oh, speaking of stuff, sorry I'm running out of transitions over here, the script's gonna be over six solid pages of text, we pick up with Deborah and her, uh, tail, Sammy. Evidently she's a chimera, because yes, those exist too. At this point, nothing would surprise me. Anyway, she gets notified on her TV that the National Occult Agency about a nameless threat. In fact, the earlier mentioned TV tropes page repeatedly claims that this is the man from the window. It is, in fact, not. This is not uh, the man from the window sequel, and the monster is, according to Zed Technician, and I'm quoting here, During development, I wanted to add in the fact that the entity is old and no human tongue can grasp its name, but the opportunity didn't present itself. Hence, it is a different entity. In fact, I got further clarification on it as I pride as to why lying down with one's face obscured to protect you from it. While our friendly game dev came to the rescue and explained that since it was a scary supernatural monster, that one would treat it like I do any other monster. You hide underneath your blanket. Which is a very cute answer, but just not an option for Deborah, who has to fight back much more frenetically. The demon can, in no particular order, unlock doors and windows from a distance, manifest via water vapor, and also turn on showers and sinks to facilitate this talent. It can be in multiple places at once, including manifesting a copy of itself right in front of the main door to the house, which must, in turn, be salted to protect it from its dark power. Oh, and he's literally already inside because he gets a free silent jump scare on you not once, but twice. Once in the closet in the main hallway about halfway through the night, and once when a shadow falls over Deborah at her PC. Why? Because he really wants Deborah. And, I mean, can you blame him? I can't. Though the fate of those visited by this monster is left ominously vague and much less flirtatious than mine would be, so maybe it's best to just not speculate. The Warning Watch doesn't really tie into anything else that we're familiar with, I just really, really like it. And lastly, this takes us to No Strings Attached, which is also lore light, but it's kind of important for a different reason, which I will cover momentarily. Maggie, a three-eyed woman, is hounded by the skull-faced invader, who turns out to be just a kid named Philip, who was actually there for someone else entirely. In fact, Philip's whole haunting charade was to intimidate a man named Jimmy. Wait, is that an Illbleed reference? No, that's gotta be a coincidence. Anyway, Jimmy stole a sacred tree from the Moonwater Commune, where Philip lives with his family, and even though he was expressly cautioned against doing so by the Grand Elder, he goes to try to hound Jimmy anyway. Maggie, however, scolds him, telling him that his plan easily could have gotten him or others hurt. She lets him off easy, but the warning seems to sink in as Philip does depart peacefully. Not that him getting the drop on Maggie goes well for him, either, as she will actually bludgeon him with her cane, sending him to the hospital, where he spends Christmas in a short-lived coma. This game is important because Zed Technician did confirm he wants to revisit the Moonwater Commune at some point, so we can look forward to that. Okay, so, that's the plot synopses thus far, and the cold hard facts of the case as we understand them. It's time to start wild guessing, I mean the speculation portion starting with the stories themselves. In no particular order, as I've said before, this TW might be related to the Warring family of the Warrington franchises. Then again, they may not be. Though, Zed Technician did help me amend my theories a little bit here, as I first speculated they might be trapped permanently in the Tube Maze play area. Turns out they're not. 
They know the area well enough to come and go from it, but constantly strive to stifle the captain's efforts wherever they can. It's pretty cool to see someone actually taking the fight to supernatural monsters, rather than merely getting really good at repelling them, as seen with the Rabbit Clan or Deborah. Speaking of Deborah, she mentions when checking the TV that the NOA warnings are largely unheard of outside of the counties around where they live, implying the local region might be a magnet for all these oddities for whatever strange reason. Maybe some kind of southern United States equivalent of Twin Peaks, for example. And yeah, that's basically all I got. I mean, this world is clearly so much bigger than we know, and Zed Technician throughout my interrogation was very insistent more was to come. I don't want to give too much away, but I will share a couple of the questions and answers from the exchanges that I had with the dev himself. One thing I asked was, is the world of the shadow people hail from a place one can visit, or can only shadow people go there? Would one ever want to go there? He replies, in theory, yes, but I highly doubt anyone would ever want to. Showing more of the shadow side is something that's been on my agenda for a while now. There's only so many hours in a day. I ask, what relation does J.P. Remander share with Joseph Remander? Cousin? Brother? Son? How long has it been since Jeremiah died? They respond, there's still another member of the Remanders that has yet to make an appearance, and when they eventually do, the Remander family tree should make a bit more sense. Again, there's many stories I'd like to tell, not enough hours. And lastly, I ask, while the in-game explanation is given, I was just curious. Why were the doors removed from the Vermander estate in Midnight Midnight? Was that just an anti-frustration design decision? He responds, partially yes. The exact identity of the mysterious owner is another loose end that I want to tie up. And yeah, that was all the useful information I was able to glean. I don't want to give too much away, but it's clear we'll see more and more of this big picture as each game comes along. The characters in each game see this world as common, normal, ordinary, sterile, even. So the fact that this town is plagued by supernatural issues is secondary to them protecting their families and their careers. So as an outside observer, there's really only so much that one can glean from each. Only when you see them all together in one big world that it really begins to take shape. There is so much more to this iceberg just below view, including things like additional members of House Vermander and other terrifying monsters and more zany shenanigans to get involved in. In the event I haven't made it perfectly clear, I love these games, like, a lot. So I'm going to do something I don't normally do, but we're going to talk about subtext. Why? Because maybe you at home have noticed it too, but there's three recurring themes found throughout these games that I find fascinating. The first is protecting others. While not the case in every single game, it's common that the hero of each is rarely only trying to save their own hides. Mama Rabbit has Junior and Audrey to worry about, Sam and Maud try to protect the Shadow family, Nurse Morton and Dr. Ida protect their patients, so on and so forth. This community worries for their own. Which leads nicely into point two, the foreign community's impact. I'm going to keep it succinct because I don't want this to become politically charged, but I did notice the repeated instance of outsiders becoming major influencing story beats. For example, the Shadow Family or Jane Doe or Nameless. They're clearly not from around here, but the heroes don't treat them like they're foreign elements. They're another client, another patient, just like anybody else. Darkly enough, Jane Doe is a special example where you can lose her in that ending and it basically writes her off. No one knew her actual name, and no one ever went looking for her after the fact. Only Dr. Ida and Nurse Morton cared about her. But why? Well, she seems to have a shaky grasp on English, and it was stated that she only went to the hospital after a severe workplace injury and her employer's subsequent insistence. It's possible she's an illegal migrant working below table. Hence, when she is cruelly murdered by a literal actual demon, no one cares. Or maybe worse, the Vermander influence prevented people from being able to help. Enough said on that. Theme 3 is naturally redemption. While not true 100% of the time, the villains of these games often end up relenting, and some even come to see things the hero's way. While the man from the window is in no hurry to throw in the towel, the titular shadow catcher eventually reforms and becomes a waiter, and J.P. Vermander himself comes to his better senses and starts actively supporting the community as best he can in wake of his wrongdoing. Many villains find themselves moved to change their ways, and those that don't often meet terrifying fates, as Jeremiah Vermander did once his son and former waitstaff got fed up with his spectral shenanigans. I hope at this point I made it perfectly clear why I love these games so much. 
the character designs. Uh, uh, wait, no, 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 no. I mean, well, kind of, yes. Okay, I'm indicting myself now. The characters themselves are these delightful salt of the earth folk, coupled by these absolutely insane situations, these zany monsters and ever evolving gameplay. No two games play the same way, even when they might have similar themes and motifs. Everything about these games is amazing. And after six solid pages of scripts, no, seriously, I hope I've made my point clear. So all that finally being said, and this video being super late, it's time for the sign off. Thanks for joining on this deep dive of the stories we have thus far from Zed Technician's amazing line of indie horror titles. Link to the itch page down in the description. If you liked it, please make my efforts worth it with a little tap of that like button. For more like this, that subscribe button also does me wonders. And be sure to share this video with your friends or anyone who might be interested in these awesome games. That said, there's always more to come, including Let's Plays, reviews, and the home of the Tomodachi Bros podcast season 3. All various social media links are in the description of every single video, no exceptions. And join us here each week for more like this, and I will see you there.